Okay, welcome to Chapter 4, A Tour of the Cell. Uh, so this is going to be some really cool stuff now. We're done with all the annoying chemistry, and we can get into some of the anatomy of biology. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the cell, the smallest living unit. And while when we looked at it under the microscopes, it kind of looked like sort of a clear circle, there's actually a lot going on to a cell, and there's a lot of cool stuff. And we're going to talk about it. So... First stop that we're going to mention is the microscopes. Microscopes were the very first way we had of observing the cell, the individual cell. Good old Anton von Leeuwenhoek made the first microscope, and uh, he observed a cork under heavy magnification and saw that there was just so much more to it than what it appeared uh, from the naked eye. And not long after that, people were observing pond water under microscopes. And they were finding a vast ecosystem of things they had never seen before. Organisms they had never seen. Living, single-celled animals. So, it's pretty epic. So, the very first microscope was the light microscope. Light microscope has a very simple design. You have magnifying lenses and a light source and a specimen. You pass light through the specimen and then through the magnifying lenses. And then when somebody looks through the lens, they see an image. And the image is a magnified image of the specimen. So uh, light passes through the specimen and refracts through, in modern light microscopes, it refracts through two separate lenses. Uh, there's the objective lens and the eyepiece or ocular lens. So the refraction through those lenses allows the specimen to appear enlarged. You see an image, a magnified image of your specimen. So here is the light microscope. This is a stage where you set your slide with your specimen on it. Down here is your light source. And these are your objective lenses. Light passes through the specimen into the objective lens, refracts through there, and then refracts through the eyepieces or ocular lenses. And the image you get is magnified. So what is magnified? Well, magnification simply refers to the image size in relation to the actual size of the object. So an image is something you see when you look through a lens. Uh, and so the image size is magnified based on how the light refracts through the lens. Uh, this is an extremely simple concept. You know, if the magnification is 10x, then the image you are seeing appears to be 10 times the actual size of the object. So, bam. So here is a spider under magnification. Uh, so the uh, good rule to know is that the eyepiece or the ocular lens is always 10x. No matter what light microscope you use, unless you're using something that's particularly specialized and funky, for your purposes, this being Bio 105, the eyepiece is always 10x. And if you add a 4x objective, what's your total magnification? Another deceptively easy one. In order to get total magnification, simply multiply the objective lens magnification by the eyepiece lens magnification. In other words, 4 times 10. So this spider here is being a magnified 40 times. The image that you are looking at is 40 times larger than the actual spider size. And that allows you to see a fair amount of detail. You're able to see a number of hairs coming off the legs and you can see joints in the legs uh, that allow the spider to move his legs. Uh, you can see dark spots sort of where the eyes are. So it allows you a fair amount of detail there. Uh, the other important concept in light microscopes is resolution. Well, 
Magnification and resolution aren't important in just light microscopes. They're important in all microscopes. But resolution is sort of a measurement of how clear an image is, the clarity of an image. Uh, you could almost think of it as how detailed an image is. Uh, so the official book definition of resolution is the minimum distance between two points at which they still appear separate. How does that translate to you? That's, you can think of it as the number of visible points in a given area. In a given field of view, how many points can you see? How many separate points can you see? The more individual separate points you can see, the clearer the image. Let's get an example of this. Uh, so here we have a nice little example. Right here, you see one point in this entire square. Bam. Get two points vertically and two points horizontally, and you get a more detailed image. The more points you have, the more detailed the image. So the higher the resolution, the clearer image, because you have more points to build the image. So let's take a look at resolution with something a little more sciency, shall we? How about the universe? So this image up at the top left is a fairly low resolution image. You can see it's all just one big multicolored glob. But as you increase resolution, you start to see more details. You start to see more points on here. This yellow point is now separate from the white one, and this sort of vaguely orangish red, and then these pink nebulae are visible now. And then you increase the resolution more, and you start to see individual stars. And you start to see details in the nebulae. Here's a little orangish reddish star that you didn't see before. That yellow one, you can start to see little points around there. And so you're starting to get a lot of detail. And then you get over to this image, and you get massive resolution. And you can see this giant field of stars all throughout this nebula, all these individual separate stars. Um, and that's pretty amazing, considering the lower resolution, what you might see if you had a nice, uh, a, well, a amateur light microscope, or microscope, telescope, a good old amateur quality telescope, you might see a nebula as something like this. When in reality, with modern scientific instrumentation, we can see something like this. And that's all thanks to the resolution of the image. Yes, there's also increasing magnification to a certain degree, but it's truly the resolution that's allowing this much detail. All right, so light microscopes are only good to about 1000x total magnification. That may not necessarily be what you need for what you're trying to view, right? Remember when you looked at those bacterial smears, did you see very much? No, even at 1000x, it's relatively difficult to see details. So you need a different kind of microscope entirely in order to get higher magnification and better resolution. So what other microscopes are there, you ask? Well, I'm glad you did, because now I get to tell you about the electron microscope. The electron microscope focuses electrons instead of light. In other words, there's an emitter that bounces electrons off of an object. So here's the emitter, and it goes boink, and it's bouncing electrons off of an object. And then based on how far the electrons travel to get to the object and bounce back, uh, you can generate sort of an image of what you're looking at, right? And seeing as how electrons are very, very small, it makes for a really, really high resolution. So you get 100 times higher resolution. What is that? Well, here's a little spider at 40x. 
Here's a spider as you get closer to 1000x. You can see individual hairs a lot more clearly now. You can see those joints between the legs more magnified a little bit there. You can see more details on the fangs. Getting pretty good, but at the same time, in order to see through this spider, you're passing so much visible light that you're losing surface details. So you're losing a lot of details and you're at the upper limit of your magnification. How do you get a better image of this spider? Well, bring out the electron microscope. Bam! Check that spider out now under the electron microscope. We got those nasty fangs right there getting ready to take care of pests for us because spiders are your friend. Here's his eyes. You can see his individual eyes so much more clear. You can see his individual hairs, his three-dimensional structure, and all its glory. So it's pretty epic what you get with an electron microscope. How epic, you might ask? Well, this is not the best we can do on this spider, right? Let's talk about looking at a specific part of this spider. All right. How about... The part of the spider that makes you freak out when you're walking in the park and you pass under a tree branch, right? You're walking along and like, and then you suddenly go. That is because you walked into what particular joy that spiders produce? Spider web, right? So where does spider web come from on a spider? You might say the butt. A lot of people say the butt. Uh, the back part of the spider, the abdomen, on the underside are specialized structures that secrete what we call spider silk. These structures are known as spinnerets. Electron microscopes, well, they can get us a good look at spinnerets. So what do you say? Shall we do it? Yes, let's look at the spinnerets. Okay, because you asked. Here they are. So, see this very large structure here? This is a number of filaments braiding together in order to make a single strand of spider silk that you see. What you see is actually quite an advanced braid of spider silk put together, these filaments. And so each one of these is a spinneret. Each spinneret excretes a very thin filament of spider silk that is then woven together, braided together to make the uh, spider silk you see, which is pretty epic because those anchor strands that hold a web in place that seem to allow the web to defy wind, well, those anchor strands, pound for pound, have higher tensile strength than steel cables. So. If that, that means if you could make two cables the same size, one out of steel, one out of spider web, the spider web would resist breakage better than the steel cable. Pretty epic. But this is just an example of how amazingly magnified an image can be under electron microscopy. But that's not the limit of it. This is a particular type of electron microscopy in which we're viewing the surface of a specimen. And that, well, there's two types of electron microscopy. The one where you observe the surface of a specimen is a scanning electron microscope. So it bounces electrons off of the surface of a specimen. And then you get a detailed image of that specimen. The scanning electron microscope was invented in 1935 and it gets about 200,000 X magnification. Pretty epic, right? Uh, but we can get better magnification than that with the other kind of electron microscope, the transmission electron microscope. Now, in the transmission electron microscope, you're focusing electrons through a very thin slice of a specimen. So this, this is my hand here was the specimen, right? This is scanning electron microscopy. We're bouncing electrons off of it. Well, with transmission electron microscopy, I get out my 
powerful tools and I take an extremely thin slice of my specimen here. So here's my thin slice and then I pass electrons through it and I'm able to generate an image based on uh, electrons being able to pass through or not pass through areas of that slice. And that can get me 1 million X magnification. Uh, that's one of those numbers that's hard to visualize. So why don't we take a look at a picture just to see how epic 1 million X magnification truly is. See this right here? Before you ask any other questions, yes, this is a falsely colored image. They went to town with Photoshop in order to uh, color it with pretty bright colors to enhance the contrast so you can see the details better. This pink thread running all through here, well, that is actually ribose sugars bonded to phosphates, bonded to ribose sugars, bonded to phosphates. A sugar ribose thread or backbone, a, a sugar or sugar ribose, a sugar phosphate backbone, if you will. So pretty epic. So uh, if this is a sugar phosphate backbone, what type of macromolecule is this? That's right. This is in fact a nucleic acid. And I already said ribose sugar. So which particular nucleic acid? RNA, you're correct. These almost hexagonal little bluish crystal structures here, these are the individual nitrogenous bases on RNA. That's how epic this magnification is. You are looking at a strand of tRNA, transfer RNA. If you'll recall back to chapter three, transfer RNA carries amino acids from the cytoplasm of the cell over to a growing protein. So this right here is an amino acid being carried along by my tRNA. That is pretty, pretty epic magnification. You are seeing chemistry, a picture of chemistry. Awesome. Okay, so that's enough for this video. Next video, we'll be talking about the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes.